Okay, welcome to Wednesday's Read Aloud. We are on chapter five, and the title of chapter five is Rhymes of the Christmas Night. Morgan, said Annie. Annie ran to the table. She touched Morgan's cheek, then quickly pulled back her hand. She's cold. She's cold as ice, said Annie. Tears filled her eyes. Annie turned to the Christmas night in a fury. What did you do to Morgan, she asked. Bring her back. Do not fear, said the Christmas night. His voice was softer and kinder. She'll come back to life after you complete your quest. What, what exactly is our quest, said Jack. You must journey to the other world, said the Christmas night. There you will find a cauldron. The cauldron is filled with the water of memory and imagination. You must bring a cup of the water back to Camelot. If you fail, Camelot will never come back to life. Never. How do we do all that? Asked Annie, wiping her eyes. Remember these three rhymes, said the Christmas night. Wait, let me write them down, said Jack. His hands trembled as he pulled out his notebook and pencil. He looked at the Christmas night. Okay, I'm ready, he said. Gripping his pencil made Jack feel stronger. The knight's voice rang out from inside his helmet. <clears throat> Beyond the iron gate, the keepers of the cauldron wait. Jack quickly wrote down the knight's words. Okay, what's next? He asked. The Christmas night went on. Four gifts you will need. The first one from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally a key. Comp, compass, key. Got it, said Jack. The Christmas night's voice boomed again. If you survive to complete your quest, the secret door lies to the west. Jack copied down the last rhyme, then looked up at the knight. Anything else? he asked. Without a word, the knight pulled off his red cloak. He dropped it to the floor. It fell suddenly into a heap at Jack's and Jack and Annie's feet. The Christmas knight snapped his horse's red reins then galloped out of the Great Hall. Chapter six is called A White Comet. I bet that's what this is. I bet that's what that's gonna be. Once the night was gone, the candles and torches in the Great Hall grew dimmer. A bitter chill crept over the room. What do these three rhymes mean? Said Jack, looking at his notebook. Who are the keepers of the cauldron? What secret door? I don't know, said Annie. I just know we have to save Morgan. She gathered the red cloak up in her arms. We've got our first gift, she said. Let's go. Wait, we should figure this out first, said Jack. No, we should just go, said Annie. She turned and headed for the archway. Jack pushed his glasses into place and looked back at the round table, at the frozen king and queen, at the frozen knights, and at Morgan Le Fay. He loved Morgan. She was their great friend and teacher. If he and Annie did not go on their quest, Morgan's story and the stories of Camelot and all the stories about the magic treehouse would end forever. Jack took a deep breath. He put his notebook into his pack, backpack. Then he turned toward the archway. Annie, he said. She was gone. Annie, wait, he shouted, wait. Jack ran out of the great hall. Annie! I'm here, she said quietly. I'm waiting. She was standing at the end of the entrance hall, peering outside. How do we get to the other world, she asked. Maybe the treehouse can take us there, said Jack. Come on. Together, Jack and Annie hurried through the inner courtyard of the castle and over the drawbridge. They ran over the frozen ground to the moonlit grove of trees. Clutching the red cloak, Annie started up the rope ladder. Jack followed. They climbed inside the treehouse and sat on the floor. Annie picked up the royal invitation. Close your eyes. I'll make a wish, she said. Jack closed his eyes. He was shivering from the cold. I wish we could go to the other world, she said. The bare branches of the trees rattled in the wind. I, I think it's working, whispered Annie. The wind stopped blowing. Jack opened his eyes. He and Annie looked out the window. The dark castle loomed against the sky. They were still in Camelot. 
It, it di didn't work, said Jack, his teeth chatter chattering. Yes, it did, whispered Annie. Look down. Standing below the treehouse was the biggest deer Jack had ever se seen. The deer was staring up at them with amber eyes. His huge antlers seemed to glow in, in the cold moonlight. Most amazing of all, the deer was completely white, as white as new fallen snow. A white stag, said Jack. Puffs of frosty air blew from the stag's nostrils. He stepped toward the treehouse and shook his giant head. He's come to take us on our journey, said Annie. People don't ride deer, said Jack. But Annie had already started down the rope ladder. Jack watched from the window. As she walked to the stag and spoke softly, the stag knelt. Annie climbed on his back. Come on, she said. She called to Jack. Bring the cloak. Okay, okay, said Jack. He gathered up the heavy velvet cloak. Clutching it against his chest, he climbed down the rope ladder. He hurried over to Annie and the white stag. Put on the cloak and climb on behind me, said Annie. Jack put the cloak on over his backpack. He pulled it around his shoulders and buttoned it at the neck. As the cloak fell down around his body, the soft, smooth cloth made him feel warm and safe. Ready, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. He climbed on the stag's back behind Annie. The white stag slowly stood up. Annie leaned forward, putting her arms around its neck. Jack leaned forward, too, and held on to Annie. Here's a picture. Can you imagine? Ooh. The red velvet cloak draped over both of them, falling past their feet. The white stag stepped gracefully over the frozen grass. He walked through the outer gate, of the castle. He blew out a puff of air, then broke into a leaping run. Jack held on tightly to Annie as the stag dashed across a frost-covered field. He jumped over hedgerows and stone walls. He bounded across icy streams. Annie's braids floated on the wind. The red cloak billowed behind them. Jack was amazed at how easy it was to ride on the stag's back. He felt calm and safe as the stag sped like, sped like a white comet through the wintry countryside. The stag ran past flocks of sheep and herds of goats asleep in the meadows. He ran past thatched huts and quiet stables. The stag ran on and on through the starry night. Jack saw a cloud-covered mountain range in the distance. When they came close to the craggy mountains, Jack was sure the stag would stop. But he galloped on, not even breaking his stride as he started up a rocky slope. The stag finally came to a halt on the ledge of a steep, steep cliff in a windy swirl of fog and cloud. He knelt to the ground and Jack and Annie slid off his back. The stag stood up. He stared down at them with his glowing amber eyes. Thank you, said Annie. Do you have to leave now? The stag lowered his head and raised it again. He blew out a frosty puff of air, then leaped away, vanishing into the mist. Bye, Annie said wistfully. She stared into the mist for a moment, then turned to Jack. Well, what do we do now? I don't know, said Jack. Let's read the three rhymes again. He reached under the red cloak and pulled off his pack. He took out his notebook and started to read the first rhyme. Beyond the Iron Gate. Jack, Jack interrupted Annie. Look! Jack looked up. The wind had blown away some of the fog. Beyond the cliff rose another mountain. A huge gate was build, built into its side. A pale light shone between the gate's thick iron bars. Two knights in gold armor stood guard under flaming tor torches. Oh, man, whispered Jack. That's it, the iron gate, said Annie. If we pass through that gate, we'll be in the other world. All right. Tomorrow, we're going to read chapters 7 and 8. And then we will finish. Actually, no, we will not. This one actually has more than 10 chapters. So, um, we will be reading three chapters on one of the days. So, try to finish. Okay. I hope you enjoyed today's um, chapters. And we will pick up tomorrow on chapter 7. A good Talk to y'all later. Bye.